hello everyone. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation by Alex, by the way. Absolutely loved it. Um, so, if you were here two weeks ago, you saw me present uh, Cloud Security Part 1, where we talked about basic AWS services, how to use cloud infrastructure, etc. This is Part 2, where we talk a little bit more about the security side of things. Um, so, let's get into it. All right. Um, first of all, if you're watching this recorded online or you haven't seen part one here in person, highly recommend go back, watch part one. Um, it's important for context. We'll do a little quick review though. Um, and also because I don't think I covered this in my first video, if you don't know who I am, I'm Brad from Richmond, Virginia. Um, I enjoy, I'm a dumpling enjoyer. There's a dumpling down here. Um, wonderful cat that's a menace. Um, I'm a third year, or this is my third year at RIT, fourth year computing security student. Um, this has changed since I last presented this. I used to say I'm a Linux lover, but I use a Mac. But as you can see, I don't have a Mac in front of me anymore. Um, I now run Fedora. Yeah, yeah, I'm officially, you know, <laughs> I'm officially converted. Um, I am a code monkey. I love programming. You can get me trapped in any coding project. Um, love pen testing, hardware hacking. I've done a few co-ops here and there. You, most of you have seen this already, but for posterity's sake, of course. Um, all right, so like I said, there'd be a little bit of a quick review from last time. Um, so last time uh, we reviewed some of the terminology. This time I added one additional one um, that I failed to mention last time, including me. Um, that is the top one, IAC, infrastructure as code. So some of you around here probably have heard terms be thrown around such as Terraform or Ansible. Those are like hot buzzwords, okay? That is IAC, or infrastructure as code. So this is using code to automatically deploy and configure cloud resources. Um, two things we did talk about last time, that's platform as a service and infrastructure as a service, just a quick review, platform. Um, you run the software without managing the operating system. Infrastructure, you manage everything without having to manage the hardware. Um, this is what I showed, I showed this last time. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk in the context of AWS because that's what I'm most experienced with, but all the other cloud providers offer something very similar. And I would definitely encourage those of you watching, if you wanna do a presentation, I wanna know more about what I'm talking about today, the security tools that AWS has to offer. I'd love to know what Azure and GCP have to offer when it comes to security tools. So. I'm looking for one of you to do one of those presentations, okay? So here's the basic services we talked about last time. Um, and as a quick review, just high level what each one of these does. Control Tower, Identity Access Management, or IAM, Key Management Service, and KMS. Those are all like enterprise management tools, high level kind of organizational tools. Um, we have our compute section, which is Lambda functions and uh, Elastic Compute. Uh, those are either virtual machines in the cloud, or we can run our code without actually having to have a full virtual machine. Uh, databases, uh, we have RDS, simple, basically one-click setup of SQL databases using, they are backed by EC2, um, makes it real easy. Object storage, this is where we sort data, files, etc. You can use S3 for object-based storage. And then networking, we have VPCs, which are essentially a LAN in the cloud. Um, and transit gateways, which we can connect things together with. I say things because it's more than just networks. Um, go back to part one if you want to hear more about all of those things. So <clears throat> let's keep it high level for a minute um, before we get into the technical details. So we're going to talk about securing cloud environments in general, high level. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, and this is surprisingly something that I haven't heard or a lot of people aren't familiar with, and that is this pets versus cattle mindset. So I want to take a second um, and look at these wonderful pictures of pets. Of course, I have a future dumpling again. Um, so you have a pet, all right? You care for it. You make sure they're safe. They get sick. You bring them to the vet, right? They're with you for life, right? Uh, oh, is there a life? Mm, sorry. Uh, but then we look at cattle, okay? They use for milk, beef, etc. After serving their purpose, we like to say they uh, move on. Um, and you're constantly regenerating this herd of cattle, right? Well, we can take that same mindset and apply it to cloud environments. So 
keeping a pets mindset would be, you know, that one VM we keep around, we keep applying security patches to it every other week because it's a really vulnerable operating system. Uh, you know, it's out of date. Uh, we have, constantly have to bug fix because of our, our weird configurations that we keep, you know, hand jamming in. Um, whereas cattle, no, we don't do that. All right. Our web server, it's out of date. It's running like Ubuntu 18.04. It's got a ton of configuration errors. No, no, no. We rewrite the Terraform, we rewrite the Ansible, and redeploy, okay? We do not care about our cloud resources. They are not our pets, they are cattle, okay? This will help you when you're talking about your security mindset, keeping up to date on the latest patches, et cetera. So um, when you go to a company one day and you get hired, you may have to interact with you know, a, a cybersecurity program um, this is a lot of professionals who get together and try and build like a structure to operate a company on. All right. Well, those cloud, those security programs are probably going to touch the cloud. So talking about cloud security programs, there's a ton of topics that we need to hit. So, so if you are helping run your cloud security program, you're going to need to know probably a little bit about every one of these topics. So like I said, this is going to be high level. We're not going to be talking technical details, but when we talk about cloud security programs, these are the things that you're going to need to look at. Um, the first being governance. And what I mean by governance is having central control uh, surrounding what your employees do with the cloud and your cloud assets. So this means developing things like cloud security policies. Hey, you're not allowed to deploy VMs in Russia. OK, great, cool. That's a cloud security policy. Um, you know, you can maintain a catalog of approved services. Maybe our, um, our enterprise does not want people using AWS S3 because we have local file uh, servers. Cool. That's, a, that's not going to be in our approved services list. Um, you should maintain things like naming conventions, tagging. That way anyone can go find a resource and understand exactly what its purpose is. They don't have to go ask someone. Um, as well as you guys should be maintaining dynamic lists of your cloud resources. If you forget that you have this one web server out there and it ends up being a vulnerability that get, allows people into your network, you're going to feel real bad. But if you maintain this dynamic list of your assets, you know, oh, hey, it looks like this was spun up like three years ago. Should we still have that? Then you can start asking questions. When it comes to architecturing uh, and networking your cloud environment, um, heavily prioritize the platform as a service over infrastructure as a service. All right. If you're just running a VM so that you can run WordPress on it, why are you constantly spending time patching WordPress as well as the operating system it runs on? Not worth it. Just run a platform as a service version of Windows, or WordPress. Don't worry about patching the operating system. It lessens your work um, when it comes to um, keep staying up on security updates. Also, least privileged network segmentation. All right. Don't be connecting your development environment to the production environment. Your development servers do not need to talk to the production database, okay? This is this should never happen. Maintain least privileged network segmentation. Make sure each thing on the network or each segment of the network only touches what it needs to and nothing more. Um, you should be inspecting your internet traffic in and out. We need to see, hey, do we notice any you know, malicious C2 traffic, et cetera? Um, you, know, you need to be able to do this for detection purposes. Um, a common model is the hub and spoke model uh, used for shared security services. So you can use um, transit gateways to connect all of your networks and then funnel all of that traffic through a firewall. That way you have one single point where you can inspect all internet traffic from your cloud environment. Um, it makes it real easy for detection and stuff like that. Identity and access management is a big part of this. This is you know, who are we and what are we allowed to access, okay? So um, you should probably be using a central identity provider. So if your enterprise uses Active Directory, you can uh, hook that into AWS and other cloud environments. Um, you know, make, make it real easy so you don't have to be managing multiple different identity providers. Um, you should be enforcing multi-factor authentication. Um, this is to prevent, you know, things like phishing attacks, et cetera, although I know there are ways around that. Um, but, you know, just gives an extra little step there. Um, principle of least privilege is something that you'll probably hear repeated throughout your entire time here at RIT and any, everywhere in the security world. 
you know, do not give people more access than they need to do their job. If they need to do their job, go back to part one. You can learn about roles. We talked about roles. This is a way for someone to assume a higher level of permissions for one task, but they don't have to have that super admin to operate email every single day. Um, and also utilizing a uh, privileged account uh, management solution. So this is PAM. Um, so use things like AWS Secrets Manager, um, manage EC2 access um, on a per account basis, etc. So what happens when we do find a vulnerability, right? Like this is important. Vulnerabilities are gonna happen. So you need to have a plan of how you're going to manage vulnerabilities as they come up. So probably a good idea, if you're doing infrastructure as a service, you're managing these VMs and other resources, you should have some form of automated scanning. But when you do that, you need to scan for both the inside and the outside. If something's internally vulnerable, but not externally vulnerable, it's still a vulnerability, right? It may not be externally exploitable, but there are other ways to get into your network. So we need to be looking from both perspectives, um, as well as scanning for configuration risks. This is a big thing. You know, you're, you scan your VMs and stuff, but you don't scan your, uh, I don't know, your, your, what did I say earlier? Your, your enterprise management services. These are the common like AWS, for example, account configurations. You're not gonna be able to test that from an automated external scan. You actually have to go in and look at and review your configurations. Um, I know there's some tools um, being developed for things like Microsoft Office 365 configuration scanning. There are tools for AWS internal configuration scanning to make sure you're not accidentally leaking information, giving people more access than they need, et cetera. Um, you also need some method of tracking vulnerabilities and remediation. So when a vulnerability does come up, you need to put it on a list and then you need to figure out and track the remediation. So who's gonna fix it? How's it gonna be fixed? When's it gonna be fixed? Is it done? Um, you also probably should have a plan to patch and or rebuild your infrastructure. So if it's a very small vulnerability and a patch will do it, um, you know, fix your infrastructure as code template, deploy the configuration patch, if it's an operating system level thing, recommend just fix your um, IC like Terraform, et cetera, and just redeploy. Follow the cattle method. If when a vulnerability comes up, if it's if there's too much, just redeploy it. Logging and monitoring. This is huge, massive. An entire industry uh, called SOC is built around logging and monitoring. Okay, so um, you know. With AWS specifically, there's something called the cloud control plane and cloud data plane. It was a little bit deep um, for my last presentation, um, but essentially consider the control plane as metadata. This is high level like network flows, activity logs, you know, things you do in AWS um, versus the data plane being, you know, what you actually deploy on AWS, your VMs, your S3, etc. So you should be probably sending all your data to a SIM somewhere. You need to be able to log all of this information and be able to analyze it. Um, so use, use things in AWS like network flows, activity logs, be shipping all of that to a SIM. You can do S3 to a SIM as well. Um, but uh, use things like um, endpoint detection, firewalls, antivirus, et cetera, on all of your uh, infrastructure um, as a service um, assets. And as well, you need to be able to alert you know, just because you log something doesn't mean your, your SOC was successful. If you logged it and no one was told about it, that's important. All right. So if it's a vulnerability, you need to send an alert to someone for anything that can be deemed as risky activity. Um, all right. So an incident happened. We need to respond to it. Incident response. There you go. I know I'm a genius. <laughs> uh, so we need to maintain incident response plans. What happens when we get hacked? What happens if someone does exploit some vulnerability in our system? Well, we need to define and document uh, different workflows for these different things. So this is something that your SOC would work through. Um, so you have an alert in the cloud. AWS tells you um, someone from some country where you don't operate just logged into your AWS management console. Well, you need to have a workflow for any level technician to be able to follow to remediate that. Um, immediately. For repeatable workflows, you can automate this. I know AWS has solutions for that. Um, so you can automatically respond by 
killing their session, changing credentials, locking an account, etc. We need to have um, service hardening procedures. So this needs to be, if I have an EC2 instance, I need to follow these steps to make sure this service is secure, similar for all of the other services. Um, so this is, you know, we need to limit public exposure of our resources. Does this VM, does this S3 bucket, does this resource need to be publicly exposed to the internet? Most likely no, um, especially if it's an internal uh, asset. So we need to also enforce encrypted networking. Um, all of our networking traffic can and should be encrypted. Uh, there's no reason not to nowadays. Uh, we should also be encrypting our data at rest. AWS has uh, the KMS system that can use cryptographic keys to encrypt all of this data at rest. If there is a breach, you don't want your data exposed, especially um, this comes up when we're talking in terms of, excuse me, uh, when we're talking in terms of compliance. So I realized I messed that up. That's okay. Uh, you should be using custom hardened AMIs. AMIs, watch part one again, um, are the base images that you deploy your VMs from. You don't want to just employ a, or a deploy a default Ubuntu server. No, we want to deploy a, de uh, a default for our company Ubuntu server that has our endpoint detection software on it. It has our, our Splunk logging software on it, etc. Build in these security tools into your default images. That way no one has an excuse not to install these things. Um, as well as using endpoint security tools um, like EDR. Um, pipelining is super important, okay? Make it easy to do security. I always like to say security is so annoying. I don't know why we do this to ourselves, okay? <laughs> security is so annoying, it gets in the way of everything. It slows everything down. But if you can pipeline, and you can build security into your development process, similar to how Alex and Mav in their presentations about operating system security and the software development pipeline, building security into that. Um, definitely go watch those presentations. If you can do that, that will make everyone's lives so much easier. Okay, so this is using infrastructure as code to deploy your resources. Write Terraform, write Ansible. Never configure things by hand. Um, then maintain um, this stuff and automate your deployments via conti uh, continuous deployment and the CD part of CI CD. Uh, when you push your Terraform to the master branch of your source control, have a automatic workflow that then deploys that into a staging environment so you can pivot in your production to staging. Um, automate that process. No one has to go and manually run this stuff. The, the solutions exist, so use them. Make your lives easier. Um, like I said, put security into your development pipeline. So this should be, you know, before we merge into master, we should have peer code reviews. At least five people on our security team should be reviewing this code before it goes to production. Um, you can do code security scanning. There are tools that will scan your Ansible for misconfigurations, scan your Terraform for misconfigurations. There are solutions out there, um, as well as, you know, Continuous integration testing. Make sure your modifications to your uh, infrastructure as code is not going to break your production. Um, as well as restricting permissions. When I say merge your code into master, I mean you should never be pushing the master. You should be creating a branch for your modifications. You should be merging in after peer code review. Um, never let your testing hit an automated deployment uh, CD system. Uh, your your CD system should or your CD system should only deploy code that has already been reviewed, security scanned, CI tested, etc. It should never reach that far. Um, data protection is a huge piece. Um, so you need to inventory everywhere you have sensitive data. This is things like PII. This is things like credit card information. If you're if you accept payments. Um, any form of sensitive data, you need to have a, an inventory list of where those things can and or might be exposed, um, where they exist, where they might be exposed. You should restrict access to sensitive data, obviously. We don't want to just leak everyone's PII, um, especially enabling encryption at rest, like I described before. All of this sensitive information, especially if you're in the financial industry, there are a lot of compliance things. If you don't have this, this could actually get you sued. Um, the last piece here is resilience. So what do I mean by this? This is 
oh, we've been, you know, we're being attacked, but we need to be able to maintain our business operations at the same time. So do things like using multiple availability zones. So deploy multiple copies of your resources, like your load balancing your website, but don't put them all into AWS US East. If we have a US East outage, knock on wood, okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, I did that for all the AWS employees out there. Uh, if we if we deploy all of our resources into AWS, uh, US East and US East goes down, our entire website is gone. Deploy in multiple regions. That way, if there are issues with one availability zone, it can switch over to another. Like I mentioned before, load balance your critical resources. You should never have one copy of a critical resource. You should have multiple copies working together and a load balancer to split the traffic. You should enable DDoS protection for all your public resources. So this can be done through things like firewall, um, AB, et cetera. There's multiple solutions for that. Um, but have DDoS protection because your assets are out there. There are automated tools that can and will try and break them. Um, you should have redundant on-prem connections. So I mentioned in part one, how do we get on-prem connectivity, on-prem being in your corporate office and your corporate network? How do we get connectivity to our cloud environment for internal resources? So have redundant connections. If you're using a single internet service provider at your corporate, uh, on your corporate network, that's probably a bad thing. Um, I know most uh, uh, enterprise environments that I've seen have redundant internet service uh, provider connections. So if you have an uh, if you have a direct connection to AWS, you have set up your direct line, like I mentioned in part one. Uh, if that goes down, you're screwed. You should also be maintaining a VPN connection. That way, in the event, you can use a slower alternative, the VPN, but you still have connection. Um, you should also be keeping backups of your resources um, and your infrastructure's code templates. What are you gonna do if your Terraform gets deleted, okay? If someone goes and deletes your Terraform, an offensive person goes in your source control, deletes everything, you just lost all of your cloud assets. You have to rebuild that by hand. So keep backups of these things, keep backups of your resources, that way you don't have to redeploy from scratch. Um, so you can just restore from snapshots and things like that. So that's all I have to say about the general stuff. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about all the services that I talked about in part one. Uh, we're gonna talk about how do we secure those specific services. So the first topic I'm gonna to cover is public access. Public access is sometimes intentional, but it's really bad when it's not intentional. Um, so the biggest exposure piece is S3, where we keep our data, okay? You should be restricting S3 access to individual users. Never expose this to everyone, okay? Uh, you, when, I, when I say users, you can also restrict access to things like EC2 instances, et cetera. You should be restricting it to individual identities would probably be a better word for that. Um, you should be using um, service control policies to restrict the permissions. So let's say um, only the highest level administrator is allowed to make a bucket publicly accessible, right? If, if, this, if we come to the decision that this data needs to be publicly accessible, we should make sure we have to go all the way to the top of the chain before we can make that change. Um, this makes it so that if one of your accounts is compromised, no one can make a change um, unintentionally. When it comes to EC2, um, I know, I think when you deploy a default in the default VPC, a default EC2 instance, it has, you're allowed to SSH from anywhere. Well, if we're only SSHing from our corporate network, we probably have an IP range and we could probably restrict that. And we should. Um, don't just leave default security groups on your VMs. You should be creating your instances in your private VPCs, not just exposing them on the default AWS or VPC. Um, and, it, you know, Go back to part one if you need a little more context, but use internet gateways and NAT gateways for internet to your private VPCs. You should never be just deploying on the public networks just so you can have internet. Um, EC2 instances like to, or VPCs like to auto assign public IPs to uh, VPCs in public subnets. Don't do that. <laughs> if, you're th if you have a public subnet, you should be manually controlling when that VM gets a public IP. Never just allowed to, by default, this can allow things, oh, it's 5 p.m. on a Friday. I just deployed my, my EC2 instance. Oh, time to clock out. I'm going to leave it vulnerable over the weekend. 
cool. Come back on Monday for security. There you go. This prevents those kinds of things, all right? If we deploy it, we can wait till Monday till we finally do this uh, security configurations and then assign it a public IP. Data encryption, something I touched on before. Uh, when it comes to AWS, uh, we can use the key management system. So uh, this, you should be using customer managed keys. AWS will automatically deploy AWS managed keys to all of its services. So if you connect an EC2 to an S3 bucket, it'll automatically generate some AWS managed keys. Well, you can also provide it customer managed keys to use. This means that if, if you know outside of AWS that one of your keys was compromised, you can e easily manually rotate these. Um, what I mean by rotate is generate a new one, swap them out. Um, KMS also offers auto key rotation. So for all AWS managed keys, um, I think it is on by default actually, every year, uh, after one year of that key existing, it'll automatically rotate the key, that way it's accidentally exposed. You know, you're not exposed for more than a year at least. Um, like I said, you can manually rotate those. You should verify that your keys are protected and private. Make sure you never expose these kinds of things. These, these are the essentially passwords to all of your encrypted data. So make sure they are protected. Um, as well as using CMKs to uh, encrypt uh, data at rest. I mentioned that before. When it comes to Lambda, all right, these are the serverless um, functions that run in the cloud on shared infrastructure. You know, we may need Lambda to, inter to interact with some internal or external API somewhere. Well, when you interact with an API, you're either going to need credentials, like a username and password, or you're going to need an API key and an API, or an API secret, some, something that should never be shared. So you should be using environment variables to store these things. AWS will encrypt them for you. That way they are never exposed. And if someone gets access to your Lambda code, they can't see these encrypted environment variables. Um, you should be using uh, the AWS provided encrypt and decrypt functions. That way you can send data back and forth, but keep it encrypted so that it's never actually hard coded into your Lambda functions. Please don't put your secrets in your Lambda functions. Uh, Elastic file shares, and this is something that I think I failed to touch on last time, um, but these are uh, a service that kind of acts like a network share. So if you are familiar with Windows, we can do an SMB share, we can sh set up a right click folder, set it up for network share, and then anyone on the domain can then go access that folder on this machine. Well, this is similar idea. Um, it acts as a network share. Um, you should be using AWS key, which it automatically does for EFS or a CMK to encrypt your data at rest. Um, and then when you mount this to a machine, you can actually enforce encryption on your mount targets. So that way, if a VM mounts this remote share, it's forced to encrypt that data over the network. Least privilege, something I mentioned earlier. Um, so when it comes to identity, you know who we are, uh, when we log in, we should have groups assigned to our users. We shouldn't just be one user manually assigned um, permissions from IT. We should have default user, no permissions, and to get permissions, we get placed into groups. Groups should have specific access based upon what they do. For example, a network engineer should probably be able to access VPCs, right? So give them access based upon their group and place users. They can be placed into multiple groups if they have multiple roles, et cetera. Um, role trust is super important. So. Uh, in part one, I talked about how enterprises usually have multiple AWS accounts. Well, uh, if you want to go across AWS accounts, if I'm in the I don't know, CSEC department in our uh, little group, and I want to be able to access and talk to um, computer sciences resources, and I want to do modifications there, we can set up what's called role trust, where I a role in my account is trusted to assume another role in another account. Um, this allows me to gain access to their account and assume a role in their account. Like I said, go back to part one if that sounds a little complicated. Learn a little bit more about roles and groups, etc. Or sorry, accounts, not groups. I misspoke. All right, so does anybody have any questions before I move on? I know I just ran through a lot. I forgot to stop before we transitioned this section last time. No? Cool. All right. So a little bit more on the security tooling itself, specific to AWS. So I know we touched on securing the services, and I know we touched on um, 
the general kind of security, developing a security program. Um, but the security tools itself, AWS offers us a lot of services that we can use to um, secure our environment. So here's a few that I'm going to talk about. Um, we talk about web application firewalls, something called Macy, Guard Duty, Config, Security Hub, and Cognito. Yes, I know you guys can read. Um, so first, the web application firewall. I think a lot of people may may or may not be familiar with this, but firewall for web applications. I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory there. Um, this will proxy all of your web-based traffic um, to different AWS services. So to use AWS uh, WAF, you have to set it up to connect to either a load balancer or an API gateway, or there's a few more services you can set up. Um, but what this does is it scans and filters all the incoming web traffic for different vulnerabilities. So if someone tries to exploit SQL injection, the AWS WAF will detect that and immediately reject the connection. Um, you can use different rule sets. So there are AWS managed rule sets. These are rule sets that get updated fairly commonly. So if you're using an AWS managed rule set and that gets updated, your WAF will automatically gain those updates. This is one benefit to using your own. Um, there are also marketplace uh, rule sets that I believe you can purchase. Um, you know, they claim different things. Um, I personally don't have any experience using this, so your mileage may vary. Um, you can also generate custom rule sets. There is a JSON syntax that you can provide and generate custom detection rule sets. Um, Macy is a really cool tool that I learned about. Um, this actually looks through all of the data in your S3 buckets. Even if it's encrypted, it will, I believe, use the key to request decryption while it's looking through. Um, and it will look for any exposure of sensitive information. So this is like PII, credit card numbers, anything, anything you could think of that would be considered sensitive information. It looks in all your S3 buckets to make sure someone doesn't actually go drop a CSV file of social security numbers in there, right? That's a bad thing. Um, it'll generate findings and remediations into what's called S3 Event Bridge. That's kind of the logging system for S3 buckets. Um, and it'll say, hey, you have some uh, exposed information here. Go fix it. Um, you can configure that to go into a few other tools that I will talk about in a second. Guard duty is, and this is not from AWS, but it's what I what I would ass what I assume AWS uh, intrusion detection system would be. That's what I compare it to. It's an IDS. Um, this this tool looks for anomalous behavior. So if someone is logging into an account from a location that usually it isn't logged into from, um, if someone's downloading some file from an S3 bucket that hasn't been touched in five years, okay. By anyone, you know this. This might be, you know, an anomalous behavior. So this will also generate findings and remediations for you. Um, it can actually also auto remediate these things uh, with automatic workflows that I mentioned earlier. Um, so if someone logs into an account from a suspicious uh, location, it can automatically lock that account um, for you and then alert you so you can manually fix it later. Security Hub is a really nice kind of collection of all of these tools. Um, it can perform automatic triggering. What I mean is like it can trigger a Macy scan for you on every month um, or something like that. Um, it can also collect all of the data from other tools into kind of nice dashboards that will represent all of your security findings. Um, you can use this to also compare yourself um, to industry standard compliance benchmarks. So you can see I'm a financial company how do I stand up against the financial uh, compliance benchmarks? Cognito is actually something that I learned about fairly recently. I promise there's more content. Um, but this is AWS's what's called Federated Identity Management System. You'll see FIM a lot. Um, I'm going to explain what that is real quickly before we get into Cognito. Um, Federated Identity Management. This is something that I actually had to look a little bit into because I mean, I knew what it was, but I wasn't as sure on the details. And so if you're familiar with SSO, single sign-on, RIT uses it. I assume most of you are. Um, this is actually a subset of federated identity management. Um, but feder federated identity management in general is that when you log in to, um, it, when you log into an app, right? And I say, I'm going to log in with this identity provider this app will automatically trust this identity provider. 
So you don't actually log into the app. You log into your identity provider, and then your app says, oh, okay, since you logged in there, I trust you. Very simply. Um, essentially, this is what this is what allows you, if you're familiar with Spotify, this is like what allows you to log in with Facebook on Spotify. Um, very similar to SSO, but it's a superset of. So this allows seamless customer self-registration. Um, so if you're if your, let's say, web app supports AWS Cognito as a login method um, and they don't have an account for your web app, you can actually build in so that as soon as they log in with AWS Cognito, then it will automatically register them to um, your application. Um, it hosts its own UI, so you just paste in a little bit of code. It'll uh, display the UI for you automatically, as well as there's an SDK to interact with it. Um, you can enforce policies on this and so that people who log into your web app can access different AWS resources through your web app by authenticating with AWS. So this is neat for like internal tooling within a company um, that gives you centralized access to a lot of other AWS services. Because I know AWS uh, Management Console can be a little bit confusing sometimes. All right, so I just ran through a ton of security information. I highly recommend go back and watch it. I will be posting my slides after this fact. This will actually be, I will post the entire culmination of part one and part two as one massive slideshow. Um, does anybody have any questions about AWS specific security tools? No? All right. Coolio, thank you very much. I appreciate it.